similar, not not as much tilting and, uh, and a much bigger structure, but it's a it's a similar situation, and there are lots of uh, there are lots of possibilities for why the settlement occurred as it did, and uh, so it's a very complicated problem. But most of my work is in the earthquake engineering area, and uh, this is definitely not a, an earthquake related problem, but it's it's been a very interesting one that, I, that I'm still working on. Go to a meeting next week in San Francisco to, to discuss some. ¿Cuáles son los siguientes cambios? O sea, ¿qué se nos viene en el campo de la ingeniería geotécnica sísmica de acá a 10 años, por ejemplo? What major changes have you seen in geotechnical earthquake engineering throughout your career? And what other do you expect to see in the next 10 years? Well, I think the, the field has advanced tremendously. Um, our ability to uh, characterize and predict the ground motions that cause damage has improved greatly. Uh, I've worked over the last 20 years or so with the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center, the Peer Center, which is headquartered in Berkeley, but it consists of, a, of about nine universities on the west coast of the United States, and not my university, the University of Washington, is, is one of those. And so we've seen great improvements in our ability to characterize the loading that earthquakes are going to produce by means of, of probabilistic seismic hazard analysis using improved predictions for the uh, predictions of the ground motions that are likely to be caused by earthquakes. Um, I think we've seen also a shift towards trying to predict the effects of earthquakes uh, more accurately. And previously, for the case of soil liquefaction, for example, the approach was to try to prevent liquefaction from occurring because it was assumed that if liquefaction occurred, then the tremendous damages would, would occur and it would be disastrous. Now we know that liquefaction can occur, and in some cases the, the damages will be catastrophic, but in some cases they may not be. And so we now work towards trying to predict what those effects of liquefaction are going to be. How much will the soil move? Will it move laterally? Is it going to settle? And by how much? I think that in the, in the next 10 years or so, we'll start to see better extend our predictions beyond just the response and how much the soil is going to move to predicting better how much damage those movements will cause and then how much loss the damage will cause. So what, what is the cost to repair a building that's been moved by liquefaction or a bridge foundation? Um, what's the potential for a flow slide to occur and the potential for people to be killed by that, that flow slide? So we're moving towards talking just about it, talking from talking just about seismology and engineering terms to talking about physical damage and talking about losses and so that whole process of performance-based earthquake engineering has made a great advances over the last 20 years and I think it will continue to make advances over the next 20 years so that owners of structures can do uh, make better decisions about how to protect their structures against damage from earthquakes. What do you think is the best way to, to predict liquefaction? For example, do you trust a lot of numerical modeling using programs like Flag is Flag, or maybe uh, the best way is using laboratory tests or scale models? Well, I think all of those play a role. The laboratory tests allow us to understand better the, the mechanics of the final soil behavior, and we've, we've made a lot of advances there in our understanding of how, how soils liquefy and how they behave, at least initially, after they have liquefied. Uh, we understand the kind of process of phase transformation and dilation and contraction that occurs. Uh, we've been able to calibrate numerical models to make predictions based on those, those aspects of the soil behavior, which we couldn't do 10 or 20 years or so ago. Uh, and I think the numerical models at this stage are very good for um, helping us understand the mechanisms by which the soils may move. If you have a dam or a building, we want to be able to understand how the soils are going to move and how the entire system is going to behave. 
um, in terms of their ability to make accurate predictions at this point, um, we don't know very well because we don't have enough case histories with the kind of detailed information that's required to build a, a good numerical model to test against. So I think we still have to use some of the empirical procedures that we use for based on case histories to predict what the deformations are going to be. But sometimes getting a using a numerical model to understand the, the, the way the soils are moving and which soils are moving and which are not is, is very, very useful in, in developing a design. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kramer, what is one, one of the topics that needs further research and why? It needs further research. I've always felt that that uh, in earthquake, geotechnical earthquake engineering, the problem of lateral earth pressures on, on retaining structures and the behavior of retaining structures needs additional work. Uh, we still in practice in the U.S. use a Matanabio copy method to predict what the forces are going to be on a retaining wall during an earthquake. Uh, that work was done almost 100 years ago. The references from Matanabio and Kabe were 1926 and 1929. In recent years, people have done um, uh, various analyses and tests that have showed conflicting results. Some have said Mononobi Okabe is too conservative, and some people have said it's not conservative enough. And so, and good groups of researchers looking at, at, at these problems, some based on analyses, some based on centrifuge model tests. Um, and there's some work going on now that attempts to, to treat it more as the soil structure interaction problem that, that it really is. And some of those analyses appear to be able to, to reconcile both sets of, of uh, observations that have been made in the past. So in certain conditions, Mononobio Kami is over-conservative. It will over-predict the pressures on the wall. And there are other sets of conditions it under -predicts. And so what we need is a kind of a unified theory or approach that accounts for the dynamics of the wall rather than just treating it as a pseudostatic problem as Mononobio Kami did. Um, and if we do that and account for the, the frequency content of the motion, so we see differences in, we see relationships then between the say the height of a wall and the wavelength of the, of the waves that are producing the, the shaping at the site. And that really is one of the keys to understanding that, that behavior. So that's, that's an area where I think we, we have a lot of room for improvement. ¿Cuál es una cuál es importante? ¿Usted cree que tenemos agrupaciones estudiantiles en diferentes países, en diferentes universidades para con ingeniería geotécnica y su discusión? Based on your experience as a professor and a researcher, uh, what do you think is the importance of the geotechnical student organization? Uh, oh. Well, I think the, the student organizations are, are great. They, um, in, in the United States, the American Society of Civil Engineers has uh, student memberships. And at different universities, the students have formed uh, geo-institute geo groups. So we have a, a geo-institute uh, student society at our, at our uh, university. And they participate in national events um, through, the, uh, through ASCE. And they also organize seminars with, with the help of the faculty at, at our university. So we can bring in uh, people from other, other universities or local practitioners to talk about uh, projects that they have worked on. Uh, they take part in various competitions that are organized, sometimes at the national level, and uh, attend meetings of, of the student societies. So the American Society of Civil Engineers has a student leadership council, and, uh, and they organize various activities for, for the students. So I think they're, they're very beneficial to the students, and, uh, and as faculty, we enjoy seeing our students working together on some of these projects and, and coordinating with other other student groups around the country. Um, Finish, Dr. Kramer. Um, what <clears throat> are your recommendations for young geotechnical engineers? You know, I think my biggest recommendation is to really 
focus on learning the fundamentals of soil behavior and fundamentals of dynamics if you're going to be working in earthquake engineering. Uh, I'm often asked to consult on projects for companies or agencies that are having a, a difficult time with, with some particular type of problem. And it's always been remarkable to me how often the answer to their problem is not to use a more sophisticated computer program or more sophisticated analyses or laboratory tests. It's really the answer is in stepping back a little bit and looking at the fundamentals of, of the problem. And so sometimes I think we get we get uh, um, too too much attraction to a computer program that will give us very nice graphics with lots of colors and, and uh, beautiful drawings, and we and we don't think about how the fundamentals are are controlling the behavior. Now those programs can offer tremendous insight into how a, a system is behaving, how a structure and soil are interacting with each other, and they're and they're very useful from that standpoint. But very often you need to look at them and and ask yourself. Is this reasonable? Is, it, is this consistent with the fundamental behavior of soil mechanics as, as I understand it? Good communication. Uh, Dr. Kramer, uh, we are very thankful for your advice, suggestions, and um, for the time you have shared with the, with the, the Genetica Student Organization called your group. Um, we are Oh, we hope to, to receive you here in Peru many times more. Um, thank you very much. Well, thank you. I appreciate the invitation to be here, and it's nice to meet all of you.